Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Contrary to popular belief, there's actually no human merit associated with rewards given at Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. Now that may surprise you, but I hope that in this two-part presentation, because I want to split this into two parts, uh, given its length and its substance, uh, I want you to know that the, the law had a, a shadow of good things to come, not the very image or substance of the things, which is Christ. We read that in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, and also in Hebrews 10:1. Uh, for the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year after year make perfect those who draw near. And there are types, such as uh, Joseph was the type of Christ, Adam was the type of Christ. We know that from Romans 5.14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Shadows, types. And uh, we also see a lot of parallels. Now, I don't think that any Christian would, would, would argue that there are not shadows and types and parallels and figures of things that are figurative like that in the Word of God. And one of the most amazing parallels, I believe, is seen in Lucifer's fall and condemnation. This is, was before Genesis, where that God restored fallen creation. He created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in which there was a period of innocence before Adam's fall and condemnation, okay, and God restoring fallen man through Christ. So here we have heaven without sin, and then Lucifer, who is yet to become Satan, Lucifer sins, becomes Satan, is condemned, and God restores fallen creation. Now that's an argument, that's a video, that's a... That's a, a, a sermon all in itself. But, but then He creates man and woman. The creation of, of our first parents, Adam and Eve, which stands in between what was to follow, which was a shadow. Get this, which is we have a world without sin, just like we had heaven without sin. We have mankind sinning, just, just as Lucifer sinned. We have mankind being condemned just as Lucifer was condemned. And then we have God restoring the fallen creation. That's at the end of all things. That's what we're looking forward to. Which is what God did after Lucifer sinned. He restored fallen creation and then created man and woman. So Adam and Eve stands in between that and we see an amazing parallel just in that alone. Now, I'm going to be talking about the judgment seat of Christ. If this doesn't interest uh, you folks, uh, then uh, you're probably wasting your time watching this video. For those of you who are interested in answering the question concerning how it is that we live, we walk, we work, how works is related to Bema, and that uh, under grace, because we're not under law, you might want to Follow us along here as we go through this two-part series. So that which occurred before man was created, leading up to his creation, was a type of what would occur after man was created. And folks, I find that absolutely astounding. And I believe that we see a type when it comes to our walk, our life, our work under grace, how works is, is, is how God works in us. And how that relates to Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. Which, by the way, all of you who are looking forward to the rapture, this is, 
what immediately follows the rapture. Immediately following the rapture will be the judgment seat of Christ. So it is important, even to all you people who are just, uh, all, all you're interested in, it seems, is prophecy. You're not all that interested in all the, 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 uh, the dynamics of how we live and walk and, and we relate to God in this present age of grace. I'd like to start off by reading just an excerpt from an email that I received here just a few days ago. This brother, he writes, I want you to know that I, I am totally 100% sold on grace alone through faith alone, no human merit. What I'm having trouble reconciling is the rewards at the Bema, or the Bema judgment. My question is, aren't there Christians at Bema who will receive more rewards than others? Well, that's the answer to that is yes. If true, then it would seem that there is some kind of merit system by one's lifestyle. If that is false, then our, our, uh, our lifestyles and consequently our rewards at Bema, are they totally in God's control? Does that mean that God controls every jot and tittle of our life and that any good works, quote unquote, were all ordained by God? I can't reconcile that, writes this brother. I would think that your listeners would love to hear how some believers end up with rewards and some who some do not. Some are carnal, no reward, with no human merit for either fate. Now I can I can understand where this brother is coming from. And that's an excellent question. In fact, I thought it was uh uh, such an excellent question that I would devote a two-part uh, video series to addressing that from a scriptural standpoint. So I'm going to show you folks something else that has a parallel, which I find extremely remarkable. I hope you find this as interesting as I do. I've called this video The, the Christ Life and Reward. And the first thing I'd like to do is direct your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, which talks about Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. And so we're going to take a look at that first. If we look at verse 14, what we read is, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved so as by fire. The, the reality there in this chapter here, in this passage concerning Bema, is, is that God divides works into two categories. There's the, the hay, wood, and stubble, that which is, which is done in the flesh, done on our own. It's our works. And there's that which is God's work, which He works in and through our lives, which is gold, silver, and precious stone. And what I, I want you to take note of here is the word work is in the singular in the Greek. It is a man's entire life's work. If a man's entire life's work is burned up. So it's not, it's not talking about works plural. It's talking about works singular. And we see that in the original grammar of, of the text. It is what God is wanting you to look at is, is work in the singular, and our entire life's work. So that's the first thing that I want to point out. Now that will come in later on. We'll see that reality presented in the in the in the in the aorist tense in the Greek, where that we see the action as a whole. The aorist tense. It's it's not which in a sense, coincides with the, the reality of work being singular, our entire life's work being singular. God looks at our lives as singular. What did we do with our life? How did we build on Christ? Did we walk, did, was our lives one in which we walked in the Spirit or walked according to the flesh? So it is singular, and I can't emphasize enough the grammar there which, which 
makes it absolutely clear that it is a man's singular work which could be destroyed, could be burned up at Bema, yet he himself will be saved, yet so as by fire. Now I'm going to go through a number of scriptures here. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's anything better than you listening to God, what God has said as opposed to what I say. So I'm going to, you know, and you can turn to these passages if you want. You can look at these. You can pause the video. You can replay it. You can take note of these passages. But these passages, folks, are all relevant to the, to the present subject in which we're discussing. I'll start with 1 Corinthians 12, 6. There's really no order to these. We read, there are different ways of working, but the same God works all things in all men. The same God works all things in all men. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now that, that is a heavy, heavy statement, folks. You are only what you are by the grace of God. Now hopefully you can begin to see a little glimpse of where we're going here when we arrive at the judgment seat of Christ. And His grace to me was not in vain. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Later on, we're going to see that we work out our salvation with fear and trembling because it is God at work in us both the will and the do of His good pleasure, but we're not there yet. So it is solely by grace, but it is not grace in the sense that God helps those who help themselves. God helps us. He helps us to do good works. Now, of course, I don't want you to get confused here. We actually do good works, or we do not do good works. But the point that I'm trying to get you to see here is that from God's perspective, these works are that which He worked in us that we, we work out. We, we're actually working out what God has worked in us. Hebrews 13, 21, equip you with every good thing to do His will, and may He accomplish in us what is pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He equips us. He accomplishes His will. This pertains to every good thing. It is pleasing to Him. It is through Jesus Christ, and the glory belongs to Him. So, so that verse, that one verse, Hebrews 13, 21, is really a mouthful. Romans 9, 21, Hath not the, the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? The power of God, and the word power there is authority, uh, meaning a right or a privilege. Hath not the potter power the authority or the right or the, or the privilege over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. In Isaiah 45.9, Woe to him who quarrels with his Maker, one clay pot among many. Does the clay ask the potter, What are you making? Does your work say he has no hands? The point I want you to see there is that we are his workmanship folks. Under grace, we are God's workmanship. We don't stand on our own. I've said this many times and I'll say it again. The Bible is not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life. It is primarily a revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 2 verses 20 and 21. A large house contains not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some indeed are for honorable use, but others are for common use. If a man therefore purge himself, that is, cleanse himself thoroughly, and that is, that's an aorist tense, by the way. It's not that we keep on cleansing ourselves. From all of these, 
He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. What is the word these referring to? It's referring to the flesh, law, legalism, human merit. And it is having been prepared is, is what the original Greek says. Having been prepared for every good work. Having been prepared, which has to be, if you look at Ephesians 2.10, for we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that is, prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. And what is that? That's the finished work of Christ. You can see where the aorist fits into this, which sees the action as a whole. We're either walking in the finished work of Christ, or we're, working, we're walking in according to the flesh. We're walking in our own works, and that in, that in relation to law-keeping as a rule of life. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace. If we, if, we, if we go back and look at verse 1 of, of that passage, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Grace. Verse 19 says, Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity, or, the, or and that word iniquity literally means that which is contrary to what God approves. What do you think He approves in our lives? Do you think He approves a walk according to the flesh? No. Philippians 1.6 Being confident of this, that He who began a good work in you will continue to perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, this, folks, this verse has to apply to every single one of you regardless of how your work is judged at Bema. Where that, by the way, it is said, each man's praise will come to him from God. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Each man's praise will come to him from God. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who makes thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? The point here is that I want you to see is, are we content with God's progress in our lives? Were that we trust Him in, in all things and in all circumstances, regardless of our unchangeable old man, the flesh, which profits nothing. Because Philippians 4.11 says, I have learned to be content regardless of my circumstances. And folks, yes, that does include your right and self. Of which, I've pointed this out before, God has nothing to do with the flesh. 1 Corinthians 3.5 Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed? Even as the Lord gave to every, one, every man. Every man. Okay, that's, that means none excluded. It, so whatever our ministry, it was given to us by God. We can't even claim credit for it. Oh man, look at, look at me. I, look, I, I created this ministry channel and, and, and this other brother, he didn't. And so there's got to be some merit there on my part. And the text will not allow me to say that, folks. You're only listening to me because of God's grace, not because of anything I did. 1 Corinthians 7.7 7, For I would that all men were even as I myself. I wish that they were even as I myself. But every man hath his proper gift, that is, the word is grace in the text, of God, one after this manner and another after that. John 3.27, John replied, A man can receive only what is given him from heaven. Okay? Ephesians 3.7, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace 
given me through the working of His power. Psalms 90.17 May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us, establish for us the work of our hands, establish the work of our hands. Folks, may God establish the work of our hands. Not us establish the work of our hands. Are you with me here on this? 2 Corinthians 12.11 I have become a fool in boasting. You have compelled me for I to have been commended by you. For in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. Okay? Now, folks, if Paul considered himself nothing, are we to become even more foolish by boasting? He could only say, in, in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles. He could only say that because we are His workmanship. God's workmanship. Galatians 2.6 But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation con contributed nothing to me. So we're looking at God not showing any partiality. And I know that may be difficult to wrap your mind around the fact that, that well, Steve, if what you're saying is true, and that even our rewards is not based on human merit, and, and it's God that's doing this work in us, not ourselves, then it sure seems to me like He's showing partiality. And yet the text says He is not. It says He's not. Galatians 2.6 2, But from those who were of high reputation, what they were, were, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Job chapter 34, verse 19. Who is not partial to princes and does not favor rich over poor? For they are all the work of His hands. There is no partiality with God even though every man has his grace of God, one after this manner and another after that. In Acts chapter 10, verse 34, we hear Peter say, or we hear it said of Peter, Then Peter began to speak, I now truly understand that God does not show favoritism. No respecter of persons. Acts 15, 9, He made no distinction between us and them, for He cleansed their hearts by faith. So we're looking at God showing no partiality between Jew and Gentile. Romans 2, 11, For God does not show favoritism. Okay, I think the text is clear. God doesn't show partiality. 1 Peter 1, 17, Since you call on a Father who judges each one's work, that is singular in the Greek, impartially, there again, we see the word Greek, or we see, we see the word work in the Greek as singular, not plural. doesn't say works, just like we saw in, in the passage concerning Bema. Since you call on a father who judges each, each one's work, that is singular, impartially conduct yourselves in reverent fear during your stay as foreigners. 2 Chronicles 19.7 And now may the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful what you do. For with the Lord our God there is no injustice, no partiality, or bribery. So we see that that, that passage is similar to Philippians 2.12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God which worketh in you both the will and the do of His good pleasure. Folks, he, God is going to work in you both the will and do of His good pleasure regardless of what you do. Okay? Now, I, don't know, I don't know if you've ever heard a pastor, a preacher, a Bible teacher say that. But that is what the verse says. It is God which works in you both the will and the do of His good pleasure. There's no conditional clause there. This pertains to every single believer, whether they realize it or not. Okay? They may be a vessel that He's created for common use. 
but he is still working in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. You cannot get around that fact. God is sovereign, not man. Romans 9, chapter 9, 29, as, as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabbath had left us a seed, we had, we, we'd had been like Sodom and made like unto Gomorrah. The point I want you to see there is none of us, none of us either deserve heaven or any reward. We don't deserve any reward, okay? Now, I haven't gotten to the point yet here where we cast our crowns at His feet. That ought to just pretty much put a, close the lid on the whole argument. But none of us deserve heaven. None of us deserve reward since we are God's workmanship. So no wonder we're seen casting our crowns at His feet in Revelation 4, 10 and 11. The 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and they worship Him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Okay, For You created all things. By Your will they exist and came to be. The text could not be more clear. We can't take credit for anything. The next little pamphlet I write is going to be on boasting and how that we have no right to boast about anything. And let me tell you that, that at least in my opinion, in my estimation, over 95% of Christianity, of Christianity so-called today is, is involved in boasting in some form or another. The text, the verses just keep coming, keep Ephesians 4.1, As a prisoner in the Lord, then I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling you've received. So there is a particular walk here. That's the point I want you to see. Don't look at individual works. Look at the whole walk, folks. There is a, a walk that's worthy and there's a walk that's not. Isaiah 29.23, For when he sees his children, the work of my hands among him, they will honor my name, they will sanctify the Holy One of Jacob, and they will stand in awe of the God of Israel. The work of my hands, says the text. Isaiah, again, Isaiah 41, or I believe 43, verse 7, Everyone called by my name and created for my glory, whom I have indeed formed and made. Titus 2.14, He gave Himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify, that is, cleanse for Himself a people for His own possession, zealous for good deeds. Folks, listen. Just as with the fruit of the Spirit, and Christians love to talk about that subject, you need to understand that when one characteristic is there, all are there. And if one is missing, none are there. Because it's the fruit of the Spirit. God doesn't manifest that fruit in and through our lives piecemeal. Okay, Individual characteristics. Well, I've got patience, but I don't have long-suffering. Now, if you have patience, you're going to have long-suffering. So let me say that again. When one characteristic is there, all are there or none are there. We walk in those works which God prepared beforehand, that is the finished work of Christ, and at Bema, a man's entire life's work, singular, can be burned up, yet he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. Did you know that God accepting works our human, our works based on human merit. That would be God accepting reward. Did you know that? Deuteronomy 10, 17, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. Now, if this was true under the law, how much more, folks, do you think it, it is true under grace? So let me just whet your appetite a little bit here for the second part of this, which is what we're going to be really digging into here. 
You need to understand a dynamic here, folks, something very important. And I hope that everyone out there that's listening to this will, will not just listen to this, but write it down. Because what I'm about to tell you is an absolute fact. The Father worked through the Son. The Son did nothing apart from the Father. The pause here is for emphasis. The pause here is so that I want you people, I so want you people to understand this. If you don't, if you don't get anything else out of this, the Father worked through the Son. The Son did nothing apart from the Father. And we've talked about the fact that there are types, antitypes, figuratives, shadows, parallels. And I'm, I'm wanna, I want to, I want to, to try to explain to you folks one of the most amazing parallels that you could ever come to know and understand as a Christian, and that is, that parallel is, is that just in the same way the Father worked through the Son, or that the Son did nothing apart from the Father, even though He was God, the sinless Son of God. He, he could not sin. He didn't have a sin nature like we do. Christians today who do have a sin nature think that they can somehow do what the Son of God, the sinless Son of God, refused to do, okay? Which is work apart from the Father. I hope you got that. The Father worked through the Son. The Son did nothing apart from the Father. Nothing. And the same is true in our lives. The same principle, the same thing is true. I believe that that to be a type or a shadow, if you want to call it, or a parallel as to how God works in our lives. What I'm trying to explain to you is that God, Almighty Creator of heaven and earth, works in and through our lives in the same way that He worked in the Son. The same way. Now you've got to ask, stop and ask yourself something here. We, we know that Jesus was God of very God. If you know anything about the hypostatic union, you understand it was a, He was 100% God, 100% man. Yet He chose. He refused to do anything apart from the Father. He chose a, something that I believe was to be a lesson for us. He could have very easily not done this. He could have very easily said that he did these things on his own. But he didn't say that, folks. He didn't say that. Luke 2.49, he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my Father's business? John 5.36, But I have testimony more substantial than that of John for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works I'm doing Hear me now, folks. The very works I'm doing testify about me that the Father has sent me. John 4, 34, Jesus explained, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish my work. No, to finish His work. John 5, 30, I can do nothing by myself. Now, that ought to stop you folks dead in your tracks. God Almighty, incarnate in human flesh, saying in John 5.30, I can do nothing by myself. Are you kidding me? I hope you folks are following this. John 6.38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, not to do my own will, but to do the will of Him who sent me. John 17, 4, I have glorified you on earth by accomplishing the work that I came to do. No, no. By accomplishing the work you gave me to do. And folks, the same principle is true of you and me. And I want you to take note of something. That this reality is so far removed from the thought of modern Christianity today I'm, it leaves me speechless. I don't really have any words. Because the common 
idea today. The common mindset among most Christians is they pick up that Bible and they read it and they do it. They decide they're going to do it. They're going to decide. They're going to decide that they pick up Scripture. They're going to decide uh, what the meaning of that Scripture is. So the Holy Spirit's not really their teacher. And then they're going to decide whether or not they're going to do it or not. And folks, that is natural. That's not spiritual. That is fleshly, not heavenly. It is so far removed from the walk, the life, the relationship that we have with God today and how it relates to the judgment seat of Christ that, that I have no words to describe it. Our relationship is something far grander, folks, than just simply we'll read it and do it. And I've tried to explain this in past videos and I believe I don't believe I've done a very good job of that. Christians, folks, they just aren't interested in this, okay, all that much. Not really, not really. They, they want to go home. They're anxious for the rapture. When, when the judgment seat of Christ is the, is the very first thing that occurs right after the rapture in which they will stand and give an account for how they live their life, their, their work, their life's work, singular so they don't really care, but they, and they don't care about this. And I, I find that really amazing. I find that discouraging. I would love it if Christians cared as much, there was as much enthusiasm, as much excitement, as much zeal and enthusiasm about our walk in Him today than just, well, He's coming someday, and that's really all I'm focused on. I think to a great extent, folks, we, we tend to look at our lives here as He's not really here. You know, we're waiting for Him to come, and, and that's the exciting part, because then He'll be here. And let me tell you folks something, in case you didn't know it. He's here now. Okay? Alright? He's not absent from our lives. He's very involved in our lives. In fact, involved in every minute detail of our lives. And we can have that fellowship that we long to have with Him in glory to some extent, to a great extent, even now. Even now. So the same principle is true of us that was true of the Father and the Son. And I believe that, that was, it was made to be that way as a lesson handed down to us. And we're going to go on and we're going to look more deeper into that into this, in, in the second part of this uh, video, whatever it's titled. And so I love you all. I truly do. I want to thank you for your continued encouragement, your messages. Uh, the one that sent me this message is responsible for this video. I hope it, it helps encourage many others. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.